Well, 1970s to 1980s, Britain, France, Germany, the US, the host of other countries, also very large, very significant anti-nuclear movements uh, seeking to close down nuclear power stations. Ireland has never seen that. Why? Well, we never needed to. Uh, a big victory was won here in the early 80s when we stopped the then Fianna Fáil government from going ahead with our plans to build not one, but four nuclear power plants down the very southeast tip of the country, down at Cardsore Point in County Wexford. Uh, Charlie Hawhey, sure, who doesn't remember Charlie Hawhey? Wasn't he a great man? And one of his many great things was that uh, he at least developed a couple of arch enemies, uh, George Colley and, and Desi O'Malley. O'Malley was then a Fianna Fáil minister and later founder of uh, the, the Thatcherite Progressive Democrat Party, I suppose a bit like Renewa for 25 uh, years ago. Uh, they kicked off the, the propaganda drive for nuclear power in the late 70s. We're promised clean and safe energy. It would be so cheap, nobody would even have a meter in their house. Oh, I'd be great. Uh, now, across the water, a factor in Britain's growing nuclear programme at the time was not only their nuclear weapons industry, because obviously you need the raw materials for your nuclear weapons, but there was also a big desire in Britain to break the, break the back of a particular section of the, the working class whose success had been encouraging many others to fight for higher wages, better quality of life, all around. And that was the miners who had, in the early 70s, defeated Ted Heath's Tory government. And Heath had gone to the country on the basis of, who runs Britain? The miners or the Tory party? And people said, well, if that's the choice, the miners. And the Tories never forgave them for it, never. Obviously, a move to having more of your, your energy produced by, by nuclear means would end the miners' ability to hurt the government by stopping coal supplies to power stations. And we all know, of course, the class war against the miners, so the whole machinery of the state mobilised against them in the strike of 1984 and 85, when the miners fought very bravely, but they just didn't have enough concrete support from the rest of the class. And so the vast majority of miners, like about 97% of miners within a decade, were out of their jobs, and a lot of mining towns just became wastelands, because there were one industry towns, like absolutely nothing there now, but... I suppose heroin dealers and, and cheap lager. Uh, the Irish government may well have factored a similar reason into their <coughs> desire to go nuclear. Because back in the middle of the 1960s, the Irish government had been roundly defeated when they jailed ESB workers, power, power supply workers, for going on strike. And such was the support for those workers in terms of sympathy actions, protests, the whole lot, that within a few days, the government had to completely back down and send a fleet of taxis up to Mount Joy Prison to bring the guys to their own doorsteps. And governments tend not to forget that sort of thing. They nurse injuries. <laughs> if most power generation was to go nuclear in Ireland, then obviously be, you'd only need a tiny workforce who would find it impossible anyway to go on strike because of the, 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 the enormous uh, safety considerations. You can't really just walk out of a nuclear power plant you know, with two minutes notice and leave it. <laughs> Not a good idea. Um, and at the time we also had the, the so-called oil crisis in 1973 when everyone said, oh, we've got to move away from oil to nuclear <coughs> because of prices. What happened then was that the OPEC countries, the, the organisation of petroleum exporting countries, they increased oil prices to bring them a little bit nearer to I suppose, what the, the real market price was because since the Second World War a lot of Western countries have been getting oil at well below market prices, deals going back to the, the late 40s and that had ended. So of course there was crisis sort of in the ruling class. Jesus, oil could double within five years. We've got to find another means of generating electricity. Now unfortunately for, for Desi O'Malley and his, and his pals in the group <coughs> and the ESB's board of directors, not everybody accepted that uh, the plan to go nuclear was some sort of benevolent gift for the Irish people. The main white collar union in the ESB, the ESB offices of the these have about 2,000 workers, office workers, the few ESB shops left, that type of thing. They produced a very detailed report on the health, the safety and the civil liberties risks of going nuclear. And this is widely circulated, both among the workforce in ESB and, and the trade union movement generally. Parallel with this, local anti-nuclear groups began to spring up all over the, the country. Within a few months of the announcement of, of Ireland to go nuclear, 
uh, the libertarian anti-nuclear magazine called Contaminated Crow was able to give contact details for 48 groups, 9 in Cork alone, uh, 16 in, in Dublin. And most of these group, local groups were very active, with their own leaflets, newsletters, tickets <coughs> of ESB offices, gigs, information days, and so on. I remember one local march in Belford. Now, this is a time when nothing had happened other than just a vague government announcement that something was maybe going to happen down the line in terms of building nuclear power stations. Despite that, like just in the suburb of Ballyfermot, I remember one march of several hundred down to the local ESB offices uh, in protest. What really then got things going was the idea to hold a big free festival down at Karen Sor. So the first one was held in 1979, saw about 5,000 people camping down the site. It generated national publicity, got in all the, the papers, it got on TV, and of course it got hugely covered in the, the music press. You had three or four days of discussions, workshops, and entertainment. And as I always say, it was a very, very broad movement. Not only did you have Christy Moore, you had Christa Berg as well. You can't get much broader than that. Um, it was also uh, a very broad movement in that it encompassed people with all sorts of outlooks on the question. Like Just one small example of the broadness of outlooks within it. Uh, I was living over at the Liberties at the time, and the local group organised a meeting in the little flower hall on Mead Street, uh, just the very beginning of stuff in 79, to talk to people about nuclear power and possible alternatives. The organisers of the meeting invited this guy, uh, a Trinity College professor called Robert Blackett, along to speak. Now, given the benefit of doubt, I don't think they really knew anything about him other than that he'd been touted as an opponent of nuclear energy and, and a bit of an expert in the field. So the meeting gets going, grand stuff, talk about the dangers, the risks, like it only takes one explosion and we're all really fucked. The thing of producing waste when there's no, not even any known means for dealing with the waste, you just leave it there and hope that future generations sort something out. Uh, went through all that and then it gets into, so what do we do? And Blackett, people, I suppose people were expecting to talk about either bringing pressure on the government or, you know, mobilising sufficient numbers to stop the state going ahead of Not at all. Ah, sure, Professor Blackett, who would be one of the best paid jobs at the time in, in the city, well, and, and this is in an inner city, working class area, so Professor Blackett tells us the answer is we need less power, less energy. You know, do people really need the standard of living they have at the moment? In winter, can you not wear two jumpers instead of one? And he went on and on with those examples. Of, and of course, have fewer children because the world's overpopulated. Jesus Christ. Like, you know, in stark contrast, that, to give an idea of the, the, the span of views in the movement, there was a leaflet given out by the, the Dynamicus Workers Alliance at the, the first Karen Sor Festival, which uh, well, emphasised their uh, opposition to any attempt to bring nuclear power into the country. Uh, they also said, we distance ourselves from those who say we don't need nuclear because there should be no increase in energy usage. Zero growth would mean more poverty, unemployment and lack of facilities. We need more energy to create socially useful jobs, more facilities for leisure and entertainment and better living conditions. So it, it just gives an idea of like, you know, because we're all united around the single thing of stopping the government going ahead with the plan, uh, all sorts of people come in behind the movement with all sorts of methods of doing things and all sorts of long-term solutions. Throughout all of this, there was no, uh, no leader or central committee for the anti-nuclear movement. I, there was nobody that the government could negotiate with or flatter or buy off uh, because there was nothing we wanted to bargain about. Everyone was agreed that we didn't want nuclear power in Ireland. It wasn't the conditions under which it came in. Uh, it wasn't any codicils or additions. We just didn't want a full stop. So there was nothing to talk about. Uh, local groups were completely independent. They each make its own policies, decide what it was going to do and all that. But every three months or so, one of the local groups would host a national meeting where anyone could come along, share experiences, throw out ideas, appeal for help, make suggestions, propose initiatives. And then these would go back to the local groups and generally the things that sort of, I suppose, most people were talking about and got most buzz tend to be taken up by most of the local groups. Hundreds turned up places like the old state cinema up in Fitzborough, it's now Des Kelly's carpet shop, or the Oscar Theatre in Sandy Mount. I remember once we were in a, a Presbyterian hall in South Belfast. Oh, we were truly broad. And a gig in the evening would generally pay the costs of all of this because at the time, 
not just on sort of the folk and ballad scene where there was an awful lot of support for the movement, but like Dublin sort of growing Roxy ground bands like the Atrix and that. You know, there was great support there as well. So fundraising wasn't a problem. You almost ha you had bands and musicians basically queued up saying, I'd like to do a benefit for the anti nuclear movement. So that was that was grand. And during the same period, uh, uranium was found both in Kilkenny and in Donegal. Uh, the mining companies were already boring uh, test holes in the mountains of uh, Donegal. And at the initiative of some people from Belfast, mainly in the, 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 the Belfast Anarchist Group that was associated with the Just Books uh, bookshop at the time, um, they went up to Donegal, got together with some people, they produced a pamphlet uh, about uranium mining, everything that's involved in it, and circulated that to. Uh, the, the sort of, I suppose, probably the, the eight, nine hundred houses closest to the test bores, a place called Fintown in County Donegal. The large meeting was held on the strength of that. And it's interestingly, Donegal, actually shall I say it's a bit of a wild county. While the meeting was going ahead, some other people, apparently locals, hadn't attended the meeting. They'd gone out and they'd uh, burnt a hundred thousand pounds worth of the mining company's machinery. <laughs> Uh, it, it, similarly, uh, down in Thomastown in County Kilkenny, uh, people got the word out about what was happening, what uranium mine was about. Uh, a very large public meeting was also held down there in Thomastown. Well, it's not exactly a big urban metropolis. So when I say a relatively large meeting was held in Thomastown, that means there was at least one or two people from every family for three or four miles around at it. In the midst of all of this, uh, the nuclear power plant at Three Mile Island in the USA came within a few hours of going critical after a valve failed. And when we say going critical, that's what we mean. We mean bang! Uninhabitable for the next X number of generations. Uh, the argument about the safety of nuclear power was well and truly shattered after that. Like, this wasn't something that you know, got a little mentioned on page nine of the newspapers. Like, this was front page news. You know, sort of northeast of US comes within hours of, well, not quite being blown off the map, but well, having sort of uncomfortable consequences. So that, that, was, a, that was a biggie. Uh, and a small indication of the, 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 the way the anti-nuclear movement had I suppose, captured the support of so many people was that at the time it would have been impossible to stand at the side of any main road in Ireland for more than three or four minutes without seeing a car going along with nuclear power, no tanks on its back bumper. Like it weren't just lefties or, or liberals or what would become sort of ecologists and greed. This was all over the place. This was the sort of thing that your ma was involved in, you know, even while she was still going to mass. Um, a SOP was, uh, well, I should also, but it wasn't just sort of impressions from people in the campaign. We know opinion polls are notoriously unreliable and that you can get it with the opinion poll based on the questions that, to give you the answers that you want. But when every single opinion poll taken by every newspaper and polling body that year, every single one of them showed a majority against nuclear power in Ireland, well, then I think uh, you knew that. Yeah, we were on to something here and the government was having uh, very real problems. However, the government, decide, as governments do, decided to press ahead and um, as they, they do in most of the case, taking just as much notice of ordinary people's uh, desires. Now, a SOP was thrown out that they'd set up an inquiry to investigate all the pros and cons. And the more conservative, cautious, mainstream sections of the movement, particularly around Friends of the Earth and the Wexford Nuclear Safety Association, which would have been dominated by sort of professional people, people in the Labour Party and that in Wexford. Like, not run those people down, they did, they did great work, but they were far more conservative and cautious in their outlook. And they agreed to take part in this government inquiry, but just about the, everybody else, the rest of the movement said no, uh, that they had no confidence in any inquiry set up and financed by the government because whoever pays the piper usually is able to tell the piper what tune to play. Um, and even if the inquiry came out with findings that said, no, it's, it's just too risky to go ahead with nuclear power, well, then we knew it's just advice to the government. The government can just as easily ignore it. Um, so you had like, the vast, vast majority of the movement saying, no, we're not going to enter into any negotiations. We're not going to give evidence to the inquiry. We're just going to ignore it and carry on 
campaigning. And when the government saw that people weren't going to be suckered into a long drawn out process of making recommendations and making submissions and so on, and then sitting at home and doing nothing while wait, hoping for a good result, uh, what was going on? The government just dropped the, the idea of an inquiry very quietly, as governments tend to do here. They tend to do things without big announcements, just quietly let it go. And that's what happened. Uh, the anarchists at the time and sections of, of the left, particularly around the, the group then called the Socialist Labour Party, which is a short lived left wing breakaway from Labour, I would, they would have been the, the main left inside the movement. So the anarchists and, and, and these left uh, instead put a lot of their energy inside the, the trade unions running a campaign to get official blacking of any work down in Karensor and for a mass occupation of the site if construction started. Uh, and this idea won massive support and then Desi O'Malley, then the Minister for Industry and Commerce, to treat us on TV to a, a semi-hysterical outburst where he warned he'd use the army if necessary to remove what he called 20,000 hippies from that field. Um, on the other side, on the anti-nuclear side, like support was growing, growing all the time. Uh, more unions were discussing it, taking so up. Doing stuff inside the unions can be very slow and undramatic and so on. But the thing is that when you have achieved there, you have something a lot more solid to go on. Like obviously, if you get the construction unions after a couple of years of argument and your members inside those unions making the case, and if you win an official position that the union is against work happening there. Well, that is, it's so much easier to do stuff from both the inside and the outside than just be a group of people on the outside trying to stop things. Uh, interestingly, that this uh, the growth in support was also reflected in the fact that uh, John Carroll, then the, the General Secretary of the, the Transport Union, now part of SIP2, at the time was the biggest union in the country. Uh, he was, I think, basically responsible uh, for reasons I won't go into here, which also involved, I think, an affair with a German Green politician. But anyway, it ended up with the executive of the union agreeing that uh, the biggest union in the country would be opposed to nuclear power and would be instructing its construction members not to take part in any work should the, the project go ahead. So with major opposition all over the island and several thousand people determined to travel to Karen's and physically stop uh, construction work going ahead. Well, what did the government do? Well, they said nothing. And there was nothing said for a month. There was nothing said for two months. And then I think it was around the Christmas of that year, like, you know, when people's minds have got another thing, a little thing appears in the paper, you know, sort of hidden away at the back. Oh, yeah, and the government announced yesterday their plans for the four nuclear power plants at Karen's Sor have been shelved and no further action is expected. Um, the government has never even tried to reopen the issue. The odd, the odd uh, politician or senior engineer comes out every few years with a statement about we need to reconsider nuclear, but no government has ever seriously taken that up. Um, in fact, governments are still, if you like, recovering from the, the popular support for the anti-nuclear movement. They've moved, both well, Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael, have moved from being the people who want to bring nuclear power into Ireland to the people now who wish to be seen as Ireland's protectors against Sellafield. And they're, you know, they, 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 they fund various well-meaning but usually pointless court cases against Sellafield and so on. But I was in the public pressure forced the government to do a 180 degree turn in how they were publicly perceived. Today, the, the fields down in Carrickstore Point that were earmarked for nuclear power plants, ironically, are the site of a, a windy energy project. You know, there is karma. Um, there are many lessons to take from successes like this, but I think, for me, the most important one uh, is one where we're, we're often very neglectful and very poor at doing our job, and that's publicising our victories when we have victories. Uh, throughout the left and the radical movement, and, and historically, and in most countries, we've been really, really crap at that. We get really excited when things are going on. We'll tell people we need support for this struggle or that struggle. And then when we finally win something, we do nothing. We wait 30, 40 years till somebody doing a PhD or that maybe goes and writes a book about it. Uh, it, 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 it it's, it's absolutely crazy. If in the early 80s we had gone back to every street, college, 
workplace, shopping centre, where we'd leafleted uh, previously, and even just handed out a final leaf and explained that it was people in power, that it was the strength of thousands upon thousands of people which had won this, which had forced the government to back down. We would have done so much to increase people's confidence in their own ability to act together and bring about change. And of course, with that increased confidence, each struggle starts off on a higher level. Um, it's not enough to just share nice ideas with our friends and neighbours. Uh, people have to feel that they're capable of bringing about change. For change to become real to people, not just a, a nice mad dream somewhere out there, for it to become real, they have to believe that they can have some role in bringing it about. And that's one of the importances of publicising any victories that we win. So, yeah, we're not just pissing in the wind. You can actually achieve things. And the more of us involved, the more of us uh, the more we can achieve and uh, I guess I leave I leave it there uh, I suppose to finish up saying that, that the whole thing of publicizing victories is part of the struggle I think to replace the politics of passivity and dependency with those of confidence and self-activity mm -hmm. mm -hmm.